Good evening, everyone. Are you guys good this evening? Amen. If you'd like to stand up as we worship God, amen.
Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Have your way, O God. We bless you, Lord.
just thank you, Lord, Father, for your house, oh God, Father. I just thank you that your house is a place of stability, God, Father, in a world that's ever-changing, Lord. Father, we just pray, oh God, Father, that your presence continues to reign in this place, oh God. Father, we thank you that you're building your church, oh God. Father, that wherever we bind and loose, oh God, Father, on um on earth, Father, it's, it's the same in heaven, oh God. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the authority, the, the keys that you've given us, oh God. And I pray that we walk in that. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may take your seat. Good evening, Harvey City Church. How is everyone? A nice, warm, toasty welcome. Anyone else freezing? Anyone else confused as the weather? What is going on? Anyway, it's great to see everybody here. Thank you for tuning in. If you're tuning in from home, why don't you turn to your neighbor and give them a pat on the back or a high five? It's nice to get a pat on the back. Well done for turning up. You can do it for Well done for tuning in at home as well. There's nothing wrong with encouraging people and giving them a pat on the back as well. Amen. Amen. Right, there's just a few notices to let you know of tonight. Um, uh, just to reiterate, baptism's coming up on the 28th of April at 5 p.m. at St. John's right here. Uh, just over here where the Jesus sign is, the dunking will commence. So I just encourage you. <laughs> uh, make sure you get in early because... As you know, TNLs are getting busier, Sundays are getting busier. You want to make sure that you're there nice and early as well. So just to encourage you. Um, if you are interested in getting baptized or you're a candidate for baptism, speak to Lee and Helen. And uh, there's going to be uh, uh, something happening after JM on Sunday. 
um, the 21st, this Sunday, sorry, this Sunday, baptism is on the 21st. That's right, yeah, 28, see, ah, yeah, see, um, yeah, that was a test. Um, thank you, well done. Um, yeah, so baptism is on the 28th. Candidates are coming on the 21st at Judge Meadow after the service to see Lee and Helen. All right, yeah, try and say that again. Uh, and the second thing to mention is New Horizons afternoon tea. It is happening on Star Wars Day. Anyone know when Star Wars Day is? Oh, gosh, everyone's too clever these days. May the 4th, may the 4th be with you at 3 p.m. at St. John's. Tickets are available on the app. 10 pounds per person. All profits go to Ignite. That doesn't sound fair. <laughs> the New Horizons are going to want to be going on that Ignite trip, I'm telling you. Uh, <laughs> there's lots happening in church, so I encourage you to make sure you check the app uh, for what's happening. Stay in, stay in touch and be in the know and make sure you, you can uh, be involved in everything that's taking place. Uh, so we're getting ready to give our tithes and offerings now. And uh, I wanted to share a scripture with you. Uh, and I love this scripture, actually. This was something I hadn't quite seen in the same context. And he's talking about Paul. Now, he sent this message to the Corinthian church, okay, because they'd committed to give a gift to another church, all right? And uh, so he just wanted to encourage them. And so he wanted to remind them, you know, you, you don't give in vain, but you give to God who sees our needs and responds to our faith. So I just want to read this from 2 Corinthians 9. It says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God will generously provide all you need, then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others, as the scriptures say. They share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So I just want to encourage you as we get ready to give that God is a debtor to no man and he will meet our needs as we take them into prayer to him. So God is not limited to your limits. Amen? Amen. Okay, we're going to pray. So just bow our heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness and mercy this evening. We're so grateful that you would consider us while we were yet sinners and through your son, you've given us life abundantly. Help those with us tonight, Father God, that have pressing needs, that you would intervene in their situation, knowing that you are our provider. You are a debtor to no man. And through our faith tonight, Father God, we just pray, Lord, that you would break through in the areas that we need it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hi there. Here's a quick guide for online giving at Harvest City Church. The easiest and best way to give is through standing order. You can set this up through your online banking or banking app. This way, you can set up recurring payments as often as you want and it's free of any transaction charges. The next best way is to give through bank transfer or fax. Again, you can do this through your online banking, either on your computer or the banking app on your phone. For both these options, the details are displayed on the screen. Finally, you can give through PayPal. You don't need to have an account, but you will need to enter a few details. You can follow the PayPal link on our website or app. Remember, you can continue to give your normal offering online as well as tithes and first fruits. Enjoy the rest of the service.
Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Are you all well? Yes. You are. You made it, so well done for making it to Tuesday Night Live. Um, so as I was preparing to come this evening, I, re I received a bit of encouragement from my family as we're about to leave the house, and it was all varied. So you can guess who said what. One person said to me, um, Mommy, you're going to do great. And I was like, oh, that's lovely. The other one said, yeah, you are going to do great, but don't puke. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. And then the other one said, I'm sure you can guess, um, Daniel said to me after praying with me, and he was like, a lamb to the slaughter. <laughs> I was like, I was here a few weeks ago. So I don't know how I'm feeling right now. Um, I'm going to trust in the Lord to encourage me. Um, so today our topic is God Answers. And um, we started a series with Pastor Sarah and then Corey came last week. Corey had a difficult job and I really applauded him because it was not an easy verse to, to focus on. But he did a really good job. So thank you, Corey, for that. Um, so ours for today is Psalm 28, verse 6. And it says, Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. You know, David is praising God for answered prayer. And God answering our prayers is him granting us mercy. He doesn't have to answer our prayers, but he chooses to incline his ear to us and to answer our prayers. We're not entitled, but we're in a position of privilege when God answers our prayers. In Psalm 17, 6, it says, I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. In our times of distress, who do we call to? Who do we turn to and who do we cry out to? You know, in order to receive an answer, you first have to ask. It would be strange if you were to walk into a room and you're thinking of a question and then someone just answers you all of a sudden without you even verbalizing what, it, what the question was. But we first have to come to God and ask him. So in Luke 11, 9 to 10, it says, And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. How can God answer if we're not asking and if we're not praying? And you know, just as we read, you will receive what you ask for. And we need to be persistent in our asking. You know, sometimes I'm guilty, and some of you may, may relate to this, but I'm guilty of not asking at all. I'm just kind of expecting God to, to answer because he can hear my thoughts. And I'm like, great. When I was younger and I heard that, I was like, oh, God can hear everything. So do I re even need to say it? Um, and you expect him just to answer and step in. Or sometimes you find the solution for yourself. You think, a uh, quick prayer, then I'm going to go do what I think I need to do to get this done. You try to do it in your own strength. Or sometimes we feel defeated because we've prayed before and the answer didn't come in the way that we expected or maybe the answer took too long. So we become discouraged in praying in the first place. And maybe you, you say to yourself, maybe this is God's will. You've prayed for something and it, you didn't get an answer. It's like, maybe God never meant for that for me. So you leave it there and you stop praying. Um, and you get disappointed and you end up doing things in your way, going to DIY mode. You know, when we've been let down by people, we often take on an attitude of fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Or sometimes we say once bitten, twice shy. But we shouldn't see God and treat God like we do with people. If someone lets you down more than once, you probably get to a point where you stop trusting them and you stop going to them. But when it comes to God, you need to understand that God has heard your prayer and he has a situation in his control. He knows what's best, not because he's letting you down. Um, he's not quiet because he's letting you down, but he knows what's best for you. And God is not a man that he should lie, as it says in Numbers 23, 19. So again, in Luke 11, 9 to 10, it asks us to ask, seek, and knock, which means we need to be in constant communion with God. You know, the Life Application Bible, Study Bible, says in Psalms 28 that it's the, the theme of this prayer is a prayer when surrounded by trouble or wickedness, and it's a prayer from David. God is our only real source of safety. Prayer is our best help when trials come our way because it keeps us in communion with God. It's important that we stay in constant communion with God, keep on talking to him. For without God, who are we? Who are we as believers? You know, you can't be a true believer if you don't actually spend time with the person that you say you believe in. To be a Christian is not just by name, but it's about having a real relationship with God. Talking to God regularly helps us to know him more and align with his will, be aligned with his will and purpose, and also helps us to build our trust in him. You know, being in constant communion with God takes our focus off the challenges we're facing and helps us to keep our eyes on him. 
If you imagine, you know, when Peter was walking on the water, he was looking at Jesus. He was staring at him and he was doing fine. And it's probably at the point when the waves started crashing and he got distracted by the wind. He took his eyes off Jesus and then he sank down. So it's the same with us. We're going through a trial. Keep your eyes on Jesus, because if you do, that's when you will stay afloat. You know, Moses says in Deuteronomy 4, 7, for what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on him? You know, what a privilege that is. God is near to us. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. But when you say, dear God, he hears you. You know, one, one image that someone said once was that God is facing this way and you call him from that direction and he turns to you. Can you imagine God who created the heavens and the earth turns to you, just one person in the whole entire world, and he's listening to what you have to say and he cares about what you have to say. You know, maybe take time to reflect and ask yourself, what are we asking God for? And are your prayers in line with God's plan? It's all well and good to say God answers all of our prayers, but what are we praying for in the first place? Has your desire been for the wrong things or um, has your desire been for the things of this world and not in godly things? You know, because God answers and he grants according to his will. You know, I can honestly say in all my life that God answers prayer. I counted it the other day and I said it to partnership on Saturday that I've been a Christian for 26 years. Gosh, I swear I'm only 26, so <laughs> how does that work? Maybe since the day I was born. But yeah, it's been, I got saved at the age of 11, and I've stayed um, serving God throughout in all those 26 years. And I've prayed many prayers in my life, and God has answered every single prayer. And sometimes I didn't even realize he had answered it. You know, you realize afterwards that, oh yeah, I prayed for that, and that's happened. Um, you know, I've prayed lots of different types of prayers, some were out of fear and desperation. Say amen if that's been you. Some filled with faith and expectation and some out of obedience because someone at the front was saying, pray for this thing. So as a child, I was like, okay, we'll pray for that thing. You know, as a kid, I was taken to many prayer meetings by my mom, me and my friends. We used to go to all night prayer meetings and I was talking to my friends about this at the weekend and we would kind of get to church about seven o'clock and leave maybe about 4 a.m. And you'd be all night praying, like for real. So there'd be some worship in between to break it up. But at the age of about 11, 12, I'd go to all night prayer meetings. And my mum would also take me to women's conferences. So sometimes we'd go from Bristol to London and go to conferences. And in those meetings, they would encourage us to pray. And it wasn't necessarily age-specific prayers. It was prayers for everyone because there were married people there. There were, you know, retired people there. There were people who had children. And as a 14 and 15 year old at that time, I would join in with those prayers. And it felt ridiculous at some points because I'm praying, God help my marriage, let it be strong and I'm 14. Like it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. But they would like, you know, my aunt, the church aunties would walk around and they'd be like, pray, pray for these things. And I did pray for those things. And God has answered that prayer. Because when I look now and I see my children, I prayed at that time that I would have healthy children who would be a blessing to not only to me, but to the people around me. And praise God, that's exactly what they are. I prayed for a husband who would love God and that he would be a true believer because I grew up in a house where my dad decided to walk in a different faith and I didn't want that to be my household. And that's what I prayed for and that's what God gave me as a husband who is a true believer. So God does answer those prayers. You know, no matter what my reason for praying was, God heard all of my prayers. And like the loving father that he is, he carefully picked out those things which were good for me and turned me away from those things which were not good for me. God grants some prayers for our good and denies us some things also for our good. I'm glad that the things God has said no to, for me have often been, there's been no option to go down that road anymore. It's almost like God knew that I might be tempted to go in the wrong direction. So if I've ever been faced with two options, God almost always closes that door completely. So I can't go down that way anymore. And he's like, this is the only way you can go, go that way. And he's always directed my path. You know, once we have prayed, it's important that we then wait on God for the answer. If we have a desire to live a life that pleases God, we'll wait for him to answer. And not only wait for the answer, but accept what the answer is, even if it's not what we wanted it to be. You know, I have some examples below of some biblical prayers. At the beginning of this year, I was reading a 30-day devotional that sets out the prayers from the Bible and how God answered them. So I took a few from there that I was encouraged by. The first one is Jesus' prayer for deliverance. In Luke 22, 39 to 44, it says, Then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. And there he told them, Pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. 
Yet I want your will, be, your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Jesus prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. But then he also said, yet not my will, but your will be done. It's important to know how Jesus approached God the Father in this moment. Firstly, we can see that he's in communion with God. He's constantly talking to him, even in his toughest moments. And then he prays to God to spare him from what was to come. But in the same breath, he submits to God's will. He's not blaming God. He's not accusing God. He's not trying to run away from the responsibility. But he's pouring his heart out to God in that moment and saying how he feels. And we can see that he has not lost any trust in God the Father. You know, there's some things that God will spare us from, but there are some trials that we will need to walk through. We often find it hard to submit to God's will when it's something difficult. You know, when someone's preaching up front and they're saying, you are the head and you are not the tail. We're like, amen, that's me. And then when, you know, when someone preaches and they say, you are blessed beyond measure, we're saying, me too, Jesus, that's for me. But we need to remember that there are also trials that we will face. And in Psalms 23, 4, it says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, not if, but when I walk through the darkest valley, um, God's, and God will be there with me. So we will have those trials. And God answered Jesus this way. It says, an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. And God gave him help to walk through it. And he didn't take him away from the trial. He gave him the strength to get through. And that was his answer. In Psalms 1383, it says, as soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. So in the, again, we see God is coming with the answer of strength. You know, sometimes we think we'll pray for something and God will give us that thing straight away. But sometimes he gives you a way to cope, a way to, to endure in that moment. You know, think to yourself, are you accepting God's help through strength that he's giving you? Or are we ignoring that strength and hoping that he will just give us a different answer? Or he will just give us what we're asking for? Or he'll take the pain away? Uh, the second one is Elijah. Elijah prays out of fear and hopelessness. Elijah, as you know, was a prophet and God had been using him to bring down false prophets and challenge those who were partaking in idol worship. And this enraged Jezebel, who, who was a worshiper of Baal. And Jezebel threatened Elijah's life. And this was his response in 1 Kings 19.3. Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went alone in the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. You know, Elijah prays to die. What kind of a, you know, it's a difficult prayer. I think you must be really at your wit's end to say, you're praying to God who can give you life. You're praying to God who can deliver you. But you're, instead you're saying, God, I want to die. You just want it to end. And he's asking for God to grant his request, but God doesn't give him that, that request that he asked for. But instead, God shows up. And he shows up to him in a gentle whisper in verse 12. You know, what a gracious God we have. At first, in the, when Jesus prayed, God gave him strength. And then when Elijah prayed, God showed up. You know, God answered by, also answered Elijah by giving him three people that he appointed to be his help. And one of those people was Elisha, who then became his attendant and walked with him um, for, for the rest of his life. You know, Elijah was no longer alone, but God sent him help. This made me think of how important it is for us as a church to take advantage of the community that we're in. You know, we have many prayers, we have many needs and desires in life. Um, but God has put us in a community of people who are here to walk with you, who are here to encourage you, who are here to pray with you. Because when you're isolated, you will be quickly defeated. But when you're walking together with other believers, you will be strengthened. So take advantage of the life groups. Take advantage of Shine and Ignite and Pulse. Take advantage of New Horizons. You know, in this country, there's a lot of elderly people who are lonely and they have no one to talk to. But you have New Horizons. You get to come here together and you get to be in community with others. So I encourage you, 50, 50 plus, come, come and join in. You know, spend time with people, build friendships so you can have people to walk through life with you. Um, the third one is Isaac prays for Rebecca. In Genesis 25, 21, Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer and Rebecca became pregnant with twins. Pregnant with twins. <laughs> it's like God just doubled up on that one. <laughs> he was like, I'm going to give you one, but I'm going to give you another one, give you more than you asked for. You know, Isaac prayed for Rebecca to conceive and she did. 
you know, a little encouragement for those of you who are married here. Pray for your husbands. Pray for your wives. Um, I think it's special to God when he sees that prayer taking place, that husband will go down on, him, on his knees and pray for his wife. You know, if we spend more time complaining about each other than we do praying, then we will have weak marriages and not strong marriages. So whatever it is, just continue to pray for one another. It says in the word that Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife. Of course, he benefited from that prayer as well because he had children, um, but he saw the pain that his wife was going through. And then he came to God and pleaded on her behalf. You know, um, God will answer when we pray for each other, as when we bring each other's needs before him. And praying for your spouse is always a win-win situation because when they're happy, you win at the same time. And number four, Jacob's prayer brought reconciliation. In Genesis 32, nine to 11, it says, then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I've become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I have, I'm afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers of their children. So Esau and Jacob um, had had a fight and they, they were no longer in, in good relationship with each other. So Jacob was afraid and Jacob prayed because he was afraid, which is similar to Elijah's prayer. But in this instance, he's asking for reconciliation. You know, you can't, you can't make people forgive you when you're going through something with them. You never know how they're gonna to respond to your apology. Um, but God's desire is that we walk in unity with one another and that we reconcile with each other. You know, they could reject your apology, but God, God desires for you to try in the first instance to go to them. And God answered um, Jacob's prayer in chapter 33, four, and it says, but Esau ran to meet Jacob and he embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him and they wept. You know, living with people is not easy. You know, as a church, which we have a lot of people, relationships can be difficult and it's not easy getting along with one another. But God desires for us to walk in unity with each other. And this is probably a prayer we may not pray often enough. We just kind of say, I'm not speaking to that person anymore and go in your direction. They have their space. I have my space and I'm just going to carry on. But that's not how God desires. He desires harmony in his church and he desires for us to walk together in unity. You know, it can sometimes feel like too much has gone on between you. And whoever it is that you've fallen out with, God can soften their heart. You just need to pray that God will soften their heart and he will also work on your heart too. And number five is David's prayer of repentance. In Psalm 51 verse one, it says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. This is the prayer that David prayed after he had been found out um, with his, about his affair with Bathsheba. And he's asking God for forgiveness. You know, we've all done things wrong. There's nobody here who is blameless and guiltless. Um, that we've done things that we're not proud of and we feel guilty because of those actions. And sometimes that guilt can really eat us up and it can stop us from serving God. It can make us feel ashamed and stop us from worshiping God, stop us from reading the Bible. But God answers all prayers. And, you know, it's possibly a prayer we don't pray often enough again is a prayer of repentance. And it can be easier to ignore our weaknesses and run away from them. And David's era of judgment with Bathsheba is well known in all the world. Even people who are not Christians know about David and what he did. And it's not only terrible because he fulfilled his, his lust, lustful thoughts, but because it resulted in him killing Uriah and another couple of men died along with him. But God answered David's prayer in Samuel 12, 13. Nathan says to David, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. So there is no prayer of repentance that's meant with a sincere heart that God will deny. God will forgive your sins. Just come to him and, and submit yourself to him. You know, David received forgiveness, but unfortunately he did have to suffer the consequences of his actions and his first son with Bathsheba passed away. But one thing I do like is in Psalms 32, and this is David's response to God's forgiveness. He said, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. 
For day and night your, hands were, your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover my, up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. How wonderful it is to receive forgiveness from God. So I encourage you to pray, pray that prayer of repentance. Number six is Solomon prayed for wisdom. In 1 Kings 3, 7 to 13, it says, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to dis distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth, which some of us would have asked for, nor have you asked for death of your enemies, but for dis discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never, there never be anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have asked for, both wealth and honor, more than you've asked for, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. You know, Solomon's prayer was a request for God to help him to carry out the great task that God had asked him to do. He was trying to find a way, he wasn't trying to find a way out of the, the great plan that God had for him, but he was asking God to help him. You know, often the task that God sets before us can seem too great, but instead of running away like Jonah did, um, we come, he came to God for an answer and he asked God to give him wisdom and we can ask God to give us that strength. You know, Solomon's request pleased God so much that he granted it and gave him more than he asked for. He asked for wisdom, but God gave him wealth. And it reminds me of the scripture that says, um, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. So it takes us back to what are we praying for? If our prayers are in line with God's kingdom, if our prayers are in line with what God is asking us to do, then God will grant those prayers, but then he will also take care of everything else. You know, I have no doubt after reading all of this and as I read through that devotional at the beginning of this year that God answers prayers. And there's evidence of this in the word of God, but there's also evidence in our church. If you just go around and talk to people, you will find that God is answering prayers all the time. You know, if you take time to speak to people and pray for them, God, you'll see that God is answering those prayers. I've had two friends in the last week or so come to me and tell me of an answer that God gave them to prayer. And you know, it just brings you to tears when you hear that God answers. Not because you never expected it, not because you were like, oh, thank God, I didn't think that was going to happen. But because you're, you're, you saw the difficulty of that situation, you saw how it affected that person, you prayed for them, and you're both trusting that at some point God is going to answer. And when he does, you have such great joy that he's answered. You know, I have great respect for people who can sit and wait on God, people who can sit in the storm or even sleep on a boat in the middle of the storm while they're waiting for an answer because I'm a person who frets. I like to run around and I'm a doer. I like to do things. I like to make sure that it's moving. Um, so when we went to, to Ghana last year to celebrate Grace's wedding, um, my sister came with us and we stayed in the house with Jason and Alicia and Araya. And one morning the water wasn't working. <coughs> And it's hot. It's hot. You need to shower. It wasn't something we could avoid. The water wasn't working. And Jason and myself were trying to find solutions. We're trying to do stuff. And he was, he's calm. He's always calm. But I think I was probably just pacing up and down. And it was hot and I was just sweating, pacing up and down. But my pacing didn't do anything because, you know, Africa moves in Africa time. Eventually, somebody did come and they helped us. But in all that pacing around, I walked into the room I was sharing with my sister, and she was sat on the bed, and she's a younger sister, so of course they have the privilege of the older sister doing the work. But she was sat on the bed, and she just looked at me, and she went, like, sit down. Just sit down, which was so annoying, <laughs> because I was like, I'm trying to fix it, you're not doing anything. But she was like, just sit down. But the way we were raised, our mum prays about everything. And she prays in every moment. And I knew she was praying. She was watching me fret and run around, but she was praying. She was praying that God would find a solution. And she was like, I know God will do this and he will answer. And she just, and I admired that about her in that she sat there and she was waiting for the answer, not 
sweating and running up and down like I was. You know, my stubbornness in that moment as a big sister kept me from sitting down next to her, but I knew that she was right. And it made me think that if we can just learn to pray and wait, it will save us a lot of stress in the long run, rather than running around and racking up bills and trying to take credit cards to do this and do that. Just pray and wait. Isaiah 60, 22 in the second part says, at the right time, I, the Lord, will make it happen. So in conclusion, um, it's a bit of a long conclusion, so apologies. Um, but, you know, God answers, and there are many ways that God can answer. He can answer suddenly. In Matthew 15, 28, it says, Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. So in that example, God answered straight away. In, and sometimes God can answer in a way that we least expect. In John 9, 6, um, Jesus healed the blind man by spitting on the ground and, you know, mixing the saliva with the mud and he rubbed it on his eyes. That's the way that we least expect. You know, God can do things that maybe don't make sense to us, but he knows exactly what he's doing and why. Um, God can also answer in an obvious way. You know, there's things that you might pray for. Please help me get this job. You go for an interview, get the job. You know, it just happens easily. It's not always going to be a struggle and a fight. Um, God can also answer with a no. In 1 Kings 19, 3 to 4, like we read earlier, when Elijah prayed to die, God said no, and he strengthened him instead. And God can also answer us while we're serving. Um, when I was younger, and I'd gone to one of the many prayer meetings, and they asked us to pray for something big, something that we didn't think could happen. And I challenged myself, and I wasn't going to university yet, and I said, God, please pay for my university fees. And that's before the fee increase. Um, and it was big for me because I thought, how? Like, how could that even happen? But I just thought, okay, I'm going to throw it out there. God, please pray for my university fees. So I kept serving in church. I was stewarding. I was cleaning. I was doing whatever it is that young people, they just got us to do everything, you know, in those days. We, we served in every way, shape, or form. And there was a couple that came to our church, and they were business owners. And they saw me serving one day. And I saw the husband look at me, and he came, and he said, just wait there, I'm coming. Then he went to his wife, they had a quick conversation. He came to me and he said, we want to sponsor you for university if you're planning to go next year. And I said, yeah, I'm planning to go. And he was like, we're going to pay for university fees. And that's how I got through uni. They paid for my university fees, they sponsored me. And that was a prayer that I prayed thinking, maybe it will happen, maybe it won't, but I have faith God can do it. I don't know if he will answer in this way, but he can. And it was in the midst of serving. So I encourage you to keep serving in God's house. You know, you have prayers that you're waiting for God to answer. Just keep serving. Don't run away. Don't stop coming. Don't think, well, God's not answering, so I'm not sweeping the floor. God's not answering, so I'm not coming to cleaning. What's God doing for me? God is doing lots of things for you. Just keep serving him. He sees your faithfulness, and he will answer. And I walked out of university without that student fee debt. I mean, later on, I had a maintenance loan because I wanted to live by myself and leave up. Yeah, yeah, you know, took myself down a journey. But God answered the prayer that I asked in the first place. Um, but I think you should, one thing that's good to do is to take, take time to write down the answers you, you can remember that God has answered of your prayers because it will encourage you in the future when you have other things that you're waiting for and you will see the catalogue of things that God has stepped in for you. Um, and also, you know, sometimes when we're praying, we also have to think about again, what we're praying for. And I thought to myself, let's imagine for a moment we get to heaven and God shows us a list of all the prayers we've prayed and all the prayers that he answered for us and how amazing that would be to see. But I think I would be saddened if I got there and all those prayers were for me. All those prayers were for a house, for a car, for, you know, things that only concerned me. You know, our prayer shouldn't be for us alone. We know that prayer is powerful, so we need to start using that power of prayer to affect the community around us. I would love to get to heaven and see that my four brothers got saved because of a praying sister, you know. I would love for it to be that, you know, I know my neighbor received healing because I was praying for them. You know, may it be that the power of prayer touches more than just our small circle, more than just our family members. But we go out and we pray for our communities. We pray for a change in our nation. We pray for a change for the generations to come. You know, we're worried about what children are going to face in the future because 
<clears throat> times have changed so much from when we were younger to, you know, where the JC are now. And we talk about it and we're like, oh, what's going to happen? You know, what's gonna, who's going to do it? What's going to happen? But we probably talk about it more than we do pray about it. So we need to pray for that change because there needs to be a better future for the generations to come. You know, we often feel like we're too small. We see the wars happening. We see hunger. We see famine. We see what's going on. And you think to yourself, what can I do? So maybe you start giving to charity and that's a good thing to do. But we also need to remember that we need to pray. And that even though we may feel small in those situations, our God that we're praying to is not small in any way, shape or form. You know, there's a song we used to sing um, when I was younger that says, I've made you too small in my eyes, oh God, forgive me. You know, it says, now, O oh Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. Sometimes we make God too small in our eyes. We reduce him to our thinking. We reduce him to how we see situations being fixed. We need to remember that we serve a big God and he's able to do many things. You know, have faith that God can and he will answer your prayers, even those things that seem impossible. In Matthew 21, 22, it says, pray for anything. And if you have faith, you will receive it. Amen. So I'm just going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to pray. We thank you, Almighty God, that you are a God who turns your face to us, that God, when we call on you, Lord, that you answer, and that, Lord, you care about those things which concern us. Father, we thank you for the gift of prayer. We thank you for the power of prayer. And we pray, Lord, that as a church, that we will be a church that prays not only for ourselves, but also for the community around us, for the nation that we live in, for the world that is around us, oh God. Father, may we come to you in prayer for all things, in prayer and supplication at all times, almighty God. And Lord, we thank you for the answered prayer. We thank you for in advance for the things that you are still to do. We thank you, almighty God, for the things that you have done. And Lord, we are just so grateful, God, for all that you do. For we are nothing and we have nothing without you. But Lord, you have granted us all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.